why do we go to the movies? We go for entertainment, we go for escape, maybe even enlightenment. I'm Joy Jones with DC Public Library here at the Francis Gregory Neighborhood Library in Southeast Washington, DC. And here we're going to meet somebody who's intimately involved with the movies. Russell Williams is a former production sound mixer, a radio engineer, uh, the owner of Sound is Ready, and now a professor at the uh, University of uh, Las Vegas, and a proud nat uh, native Washingtonian who grew up in Benning Heights and made his way to Hollywood. And we're gonna find out just how he made that journey today. Thank you so much for joining us for our interview with Russell Williams II. Welcome, Russell. <laughs> Joy, good to see you. And um, yes, I, I wanted to make sure everybody knew I was from Benning Heights. 51st and H. That was my launching pad. <laughs> you know, Russell, uh, I remember when you won, I think, your first Academy Award. Uh, I saw the news story on the local ABC affiliate here. And scrolling under the story, it said Russell Williams, Southeast DC resident. And I thought, hmm, he made them uh, make note of the fact that he was from Southeast DC, not just DC, but Southeast DC. Tell us why you did that. Well, uh, Joy, uh, growing up in that side of the Anacostia River, even in the 50s and 60s, you know, uh, there was a certain sort of you know, griminess sometimes associated with Southeast as if we weren't as forward thinking, as if we weren't as engaged, as if we weren't as motivated as uh, some of the folks in the other quadrants. And um, it was always something that I was proud of because the Southeast that I grew up in was a community. Um, even on my Facebook page, I have a lot of my former neighbors and, and to a degree their parents, but most of the parents have passed away now, that uh, we were all in each other's arms. Everybody looked out for everybody else. Uh, you couldn't go around the corner and get into some mischief and think that that wasn't going to be reported even much faster than you have now with text and Instagram and all these digital um, apps you know it was it was the drum it was the rotary phone it was that look on the porch down the street to another parent and that signal was speed of light you know your son has been over here misbehaving you need to deal with that um it came up through dc public schools um i think my first library was capitol view down off All of right. central avenue I, and i can't i can't say with assuredness that we were there the day that it opened but i know within that first week because my parents were always about openings you know one example we drove around the beltway the day that the beltway opened <laughs> just to say we were there you know i know i was there the opening of air and space i know i was there the opening of um what used to be called history and technology at the smithsonian those sort of things so um, all through uh, my public school education there in D.C. and just kind of maturing from childhood to adulthood, uh, I would stand flat footed with shoulders broad and say, yeah, I'm from Southeast. All right. You all know right. what I'm saying? And, it's, now, and it's, still, you... it's, it's still something that that gives me pride. Now, everybody has dreams of flying out to California and making it good. You actually did it. So tell me, what was the thought process when you decided to leave Washington and move to Los Angeles? Okay, well, Joy, it, it wasn't an instantaneous spur of the moment sort of thing. Um, I assure you that growing up in DC and being a lover of feature films, uh, you know, back in those days, uh, for some of the younger people who may be viewing, you had to leave home to go to the movies. There was no seeing movies on your television screen. And even 
in the 80s when you had VHS or when you had movies of the week on certain networks, it still didn't say there was a path from growing up in D.C., which was essentially owned by either the D.C. or the federal government in terms of employment and going across country. But I, I would point to a couple uh, touchstones. One, uh, there was a movie, uh, really wasn't much of a movie, but it was a movie that had a scene in it that I remembered as a kid called The Sandpiper, starring mm. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. And typically in those years in the 60s, my parents and I would go to New York and do this typical New York touristy thing with Staten Island Ferry, Statue of Liberty, uh, probably not a Broadway play, but certainly Radio City Music Hall. And at the Radio City Music Hall, there was always a movie, some short subjects, and then of course the Rockettes. Well, this particular uh, weekend, this movie, The Sandpiper was playing and it opened with this beautiful aerial footage of this, you know, you know, landmass and the ocean and this highway. And I, I was like, that didn't look like anything I had seen in Virginia, the Carolinas, New York, New Jersey, which is where we did most <laughs> of our road trips. So I asked my dad, even though my mother answered, I said, dad, I said, is that in the United States? And my mother said, yes, Russell, that's in California. And so I said to both of them, well, you'll be getting some postcards from California one day. So as, as you were wow. saying in your intro, you know, the escape, but also, you know, enlightenment. And, and I was like, well, I just wanted to see what that looked like in three dimensions since I had never seen that type of topography. I would say, let's move on to another film. In 1967, there was a film that was released called In the Heat of the Night starring Sidney Poitier and Rod Steiger. Both of them got nominated for Oscars for Best Actor. Rod Steiger ended up winning that year, uh, playing the bigoted sheriff in a, uh, a fictional town that was based on a lot of real towns in the Deep South and the Up South, which of course, anything South of Canada, Malcolm X said was the Up South. But in that particular film, there was another name on the credits that sort of woke me to the concept of African-Americans working behind camera mm. because we had been on camera since the silent pictures, not necessarily in a, in a, in a very, you know, respectful way and not actually in many cases, actually African-Americans, but white men in blackface portraying this, you know, caricature or this very bigoted view of African Americans. But to see this name on this on these credits that say Quincy Jones. All uh, right okay. now. Okay, wait a minute. So he actually wrote the score for In the Heat of the Night. And one of the first singers that I could recognize immediately as soon as his voice came across the radio was Ray Charles. And he did the the you know the opening title song. And so I was like, wow, I said, now that was a revelation because I only thought of if you were an African-American and you went to Hollywood, your basic path was in front of the camp. So again, I was still just in junior high school, what they call middle school these days. So it wasn't like jump on a plane and go out to LA. <laughs> <laughs> but at least there was a seed planted. By that time, I was already deeply into music, deeply into jazz. Uh, so essentially, that meant I was already doing some measure of critical listening. And then by the time it was, uh, uh, you know, moving from high school to college, I went to American University, you know, right there in Northwest DC. And so initially, I thought I was going to be a music major, but by the time I put the little notation on the application as to what my preferred major was, I just put the broad category of communications. So long story short, over those four years, I went from being interested in journalism to being interested in broadcasting to then discovering the production aspect of making film, mostly of course, documentary at that time and of course, in that time, in the 70s, we were still shooting daily news on film. So I got some actual day to day and on the job training working in the film business by working at Channel 7 local there, which was still on Connecticut Avenue. 
And so it really just kind of tied everything I had experienced as a kid in terms of loving movies into understanding the process of making movies. So that's when I declared my major as film. Uh, it also didn't hurt that on the Channel 7 gig, I was able to go to Rome uh, with the then Good Morning America. Actually, it was called AM America back then before it became Good Morning. So your local stations had an AM New York, AM Washington, AM whatever. And so the AM Washington crew was invited to go to Rome to do kind of like a, a touristy junket for oh. Pan Am. Now, you younger people will have to Google Pan Am because that airline has long been gone. But they flew us over on Pan Am to go to the Vatican, to go to the Garden of Gian Niccolo, to see the Colosseum and things like that. And so that connected another dream I had, which was to travel. So when I thought of travel, I thought of rich folks, you know, because they just <laughs> put money down on the table and they end up on this train or first class, you know, in the in the in the airliners or they had this really fancy car to go driving around. But I never thought of travel being built into your career, which meant your employer paid for all of that. So when Channel 7 sent us over there, I said, OK, well, they booked the flight. They booked the hotel. Um, I was getting a salary, but they also gave us per diem. And I was like, yeah, I kind of like this film. Yeah, I like that too. You know, so <laughs> that basically that basically erased my uh, my dreams of staying at Channel 4 and working in the broadcast field down in the dark basement with a lot of monitors on. And so, sent me... sent me decided to actually relocate, what were you hoping to do and what job were you looking for? Okay, so uh, it's, it's an interesting... Um, thing the way life always offers you a fork in the road. And, you know, Yogi Berra, the famous New York Yankees catcher, say when you come to a fork in the road, take it. But of course, and he didn't say take the left fork or the right fork. That's why it was such a memorable quote of many of the yogiisms that he uh, spouted. But in the same pile of mail that American Film Institute said no to my application to get into their directing program, the IRS, probably one of the last times they ever sent me money, gave me a big tax return. And so I said, OK, well, there's more than one way to get to Los Angeles. So by the time I had worked at seven in Washington and done some documentary work there and maybe some freelance gigs, I said, well, maybe I can just go to L.A. and follow the craft of sound. Because one thing I found out early is everybody who wanted to work behind the camera wanted to do camera but almost no one wanted to do sound. And so it's against my religion to wait in line anyway. I just got into the craft where there was no line. And then I also kind of was already sort of on that path. Again, a music student, uh, when I was at uh, American U, I was the co-founder of a radio program that you know uh, quite a bit about, Joy, called Spirits Known and Unknown. Hooray for spirits. And so, so in that particular experience, I got my first ex exposure to professional audio key, audio gear. So real tape recorders, real microphones, and going out and recording interviews in the field, which meant you had traffic or sometimes office noise and things in the background. And how do you improve upon that? So all of that led me to um, moving to Los Angeles, which I assure you in 1979, it was not an original idea. It would not have been an original idea in 1929 either. So, the, the, so you must understand when you get off the plane at LAX, even to this day, there are a whole lot of other people getting off planes having the same goal. So long story short, the first place that I actually got to see a real movie studio was then MGM, which is now Sony. And there was this little bitty night soap opera show called Dallas. Right, because I was still very prejudiced towards doing feature films in that television. But the first real movie set I got to see was at MGM. And I realized that they had built Larry Hagman, who played JR on, on the Dallas series. They had built his house full scale inside the soundstage. And I said, ah, OK, this is a lot bigger scale than anything I had been exposed to in DC. 
compete. So <laughs> at that sound stage, I committed myself to 10 years before I could throw in the towel and say, well, I tried the business and it didn't work out for me. I, I said I had to commit 10 years to, if I was serious about this. Mm -hmm. Now, your job title was sound production mixer. Tell us what Correct. that person does. OK, so um, I'm sure most people have seen maybe not knowing what they call these, but they have this thing called the EPK, the electronic press kit. And generally speaking, you'll see behind the scenes footage of, you know, say whatever the movies that are nominated this particular year. And you'll see them. You'll see the people on the camera operating behind the camera. And you might see a person with a microphone fishpole. You'll see the actors maybe rehearsing their lines or practicing a stunt. So when the camera does roll on the actual production, while these people are being photographed, my team is responsible for recording the lines of dialogue that they are saying while they are on camera, which means we are on set the entire time the movie is being filmed. So from day one to day last, if there's dialogue, or even if there's no dialogue, but we're getting the wind in the trees or a car screeching around the corner or the river rippling you know, down to the ocean, anything that we feel could be useful in creating what we call the soundscape for the editorial people and then post-production sound, my team was responsible for that. So that meant long days, sometimes six day weeks, minimum 12 hour days, usually more like 15 hours. And um, sometimes you're working in a very controlled sound stage where most of the outside world is shut off when we close the doors. And other times you're in the middle of the prairie with 5,000 buffalo running parallel to where your camera is. And I just saw something recently where some uh, not so young lady got a little too close to a bison and the and 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 the bison said, oh, no, no, you're not going to come up and molest my kids with that camera. It's kind of like those things have an attitude. They can run 35 to 40 miles an hour. You don't want to wow. be anywhere near those animals when they have an attitude. OK, so um, that was more true to what I would do every day, but sometimes it's riding around a car in a, in a car for two and a half months with Denzel Washington and Ethan Hawke in training day. Because for those two and a half months, most of our set was that car. You know, a lot of dialogue They're going from hither and thither and yon and they get out and they go, you know, brace a drug dealer or they pull some college kids over for smoking weed in the car or they go up, you know, to a neighborhood where they're like trying to keep a lid on the gang activity, et cetera, et cetera. But wherever these actors are being photographed, that's where our team would be to make sure we get hopefully usable dialogue. So my, my motto was it still needed to work as radio meaning our recording had to work as if there was no picture to go along with it. And of course, when you do marry it to the picture, it's your compliment, what you see. So in, in a nutshell, that, that's, that's what my team did. You made a comment that the ears are the eyes in the back of your head. Elaborate on that for me. Well, uh, it was just an observation, I think that I had from, of course, understanding that the fact that there are any human beings left on the planet is due to the fact that they heard trouble coming up behind them, you know, like a predator that wanted to make you lunch or dinner. So <laughs> or a buffalo with an attitude. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I really feel that when you are experiencing really good movies or really good content that's on television series. Uh, uh, you you must not ignore the fact that maybe even more than 50 percent of your experience of really being immersed in something comes from what you hear and not completely from what you see. Uh, with my students at various universities, I would ask them, why did War of the Worlds as a radio show scare a whole lot more people than either one of the very well done feature films that were based on War of the Worlds. 
That's and, true. And what and what would be your answer to that question, Joe, if I pose that to you as a student? Why well, would the radio program be more, you know, why were people calling their next of kin saying, I think this might be the last time we talk, because based on this news story, these things are just right over the hill from me, you know. So I, th I think the sound engages your imagination uh, more fully than when all the dots are connected with the visual and the audio. I know when you go to the movie and you see the girl put her hand on the knob to go into the room, and that scary, creepy right. is playing, you're like, no, don't go in there, don't go in there. Right. <laughs> she always goes in the <laughs> But a lot of times the movie is more, I mean, the music is more, uh, emotion evoking than the visual okay so now just to make sure your your viewers will differentiate i had nothing to do with the music per se but they mm -hmm. it does do some of what you said actually i have some colleagues in the hollywood area that call music emotional fascism you know <laughs> so in the days when the movies were really really brand new the music's job was to make sure you didn't miss that this is a scene that's supposed to be touching. And this is a scene that's supposed to be, you know, oh my God, it's supposed to be fearful. And this is a scene of triumph. You know, the music would always give you a cue as to how you should feel at any one moment or the other. But back to your answer to my question, absolutely. Your imagination will create a monster that's guaranteed to scare you because you know what scares you. <laughs> Now, my monster may look different, but my monster is going to work on me because I know what scares me. The filmmaker's monster may or may not scare you visually. But if you're just creating these images in your own mind, I assure you the monster that you have already painted a picture of is going to do the job. So uh, filmmakers that come through film school in a lot of cases, if they're not taking sound courses, then they're missing a whole lot of the experience that the audience is really dependent upon. Now, the audience may not be able to tell you specifically it was something that they heard that made the movie more enjoyable or more real to them. But I assure you, if you go back and watch the first Jurassic Park and you fast forward to the scene where the kids are in the car, they hear or they finally see the water in the glass that's vibrating because of what they call the impact tremor. And then they notice a T-Rex is right outside their window and it leans down and looks in the window. Now turn the sound off and see if that scene is anywhere near as scary as when you hear that thing breathing <laughs> and it looks in there and it growls and you realize I uh, neither the hors d'oeuvre, the main course, but either way, this doesn't look good. This is not the park we had in mind when we signed up for this park. OK, so that's to me just an extreme example of how sound works. But then, of course, there are a lot more subtle ways that sound works. And some of this we get on location. Some of this is created. Say, for instance, it's a futuristic piece and we don't know what this item would sound like. Then it's somebody's job to create this. What would this sound like two centuries from now or 50 years from now? And then um, to me, this was the way I got in the business. And the more directors I worked with who were really attuned to how sound works in a storytelling fashion, the more enjoyable my job became. If it was just kind of like putting sound together with picture and they didn't really want my opinion on anything, okay, well, the check cleared. And that was fine, too. But of, of course, I'm really more interested in being part of the creative aspect than just being sort of a mechanic. Tell us about the two movies for which you won your Academy Awards. OK, um, one of one of the things I want to say about both of those films, and and this is, I think, really important to understand how any highly competitive field works. And certainly the motion picture television industry is a highly competitive field. It's a relationship business. So there's no way I get on Glory, which, my, which was, turned out to be our first Oscar, where if I had kind of like said, well, this little 
TV pilot that didn't go anywhere, but the unit manager, who's basically the person responsible for hiring the crew, if he or she, and in this case, it was a he, if he didn't like my work on that little low budget piece that was probably four years before Glory, didn't call me ever again until he called me to say, Russell, I think that this picture we're dealing with Matthew Broderick, it's about a Civil War unit and uh, I'd like you to come in and meet our director and our producer because I think this would be a good project for you. Now, out of all the people he'd worked with in the last five years, he called me because he apparently liked my work from that little project we did. And I'm talking about a little project. So don't soft pedal those projects that don't have big names associated with them or big budgets because they are still someone's dream to hit it big. So that means you have to take all those small projects as seriously as you would if you saw marquee names in the cast, a marquee director calling action and cut, big budgets, big studio sets. I assure you, you won't get there if you don't take the little minimum, close to minimum wage projects seriously. Same thing with Dances with Wolves. I don't get to meet and work with Kevin Costner unless I do this movie called Field of Dreams because that was the first opportunity I had to work with Kevin and Kevin being loyal, like our director from field of dreams, he picked people he liked working with to do his directorial debut from bull dorm, from no way out from field and other movies he had done. The only reason I get to field is because our director wanted to bring his entire crew back from the first low budget film he did, which didn't really go anywhere. But the Gordon brothers, who probably aren't household names, but their franchise is a household name because the Gordon brothers not only produced Field of Dreams, but they produced the Die Hard franchise. Wow. Exactly. And so they wanted Phil Robinson to direct. They were very, very happy with the screenplay, but he didn't want to direct. He said, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not really, no, nah, no. Nah. So the only way they convinced him to direct is he says, bring all my crew people back from my first movie. And then I'll be standing basically in front of family when we do this film. And so that level of loyalty moved me from, again, a movie that almost no one has seen to feel the dreams, which is an American classic in and of itself, to 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 ultimately getting to Dancing with Wolves and then getting into the history books as the first African American ever win two Oscars. There's another sort of full circle experience from Glory, because I tell my students, I said, you know, you need to develop a work ethic. You need to develop a personality and a willingness to do the jobs that don't have any real flash or real you know like pizzazz to them it's like get that mop understand how to use a broom and a dustpan you know i did dishes at the state department cafeteria at nasa's cafeteria you know minimum wage jobs in dc but i assure you my first time trying to develop this personality that everybody takes for granted with total strangers happened working at this little place called mcdonald's, McDonald's up at Coral Hills, Maryland, okay? And so it just turned out to be full circle that the morning that I found out that we got nominated for Glory, that my team and I were working on a McDonald's commercial. Okay, make that make sense if you can. You know what I'm saying? I had to call a friend of mine back in DC because I was such a novice about this whole Oscar thing. I didn't realize all I had to do was call the Motion Picture Academy that morning and say, well, who got nominated for sound? I'm sitting there thinking, okay, well, I know it'll be in the LA Times tomorrow, but who can wait that long? Hey. You know, so I actually called back to DC because I had plenty of friends who were still working in the news media. And I said, look on the teletype machine. Now, you young people will have to Google that and see this typewriter that was in this box that was that would just type out all these headlines because I said, I know that the full Academy nomination list would be on the teletype. And a friend of mine named Joya Jefferson, who's now Joya Nuri, 
called me from DC and left a message on my voicemail that said, Russell, you got nominated for glory. Wow. And so then I told the producer of this McDonald's commercial who was from Burrell in Chicago, a very famous black ad agency. And they stopped the McDonald's commercial, went out and got some cake and champagne uh, in the midst of all these free French fries that you get when you work on a McDonald's commercial. I don't know if they still do that now. But it, it just kind of shows you a commitment that I had that had nothing to do with the movie business when I was working at McDonald's. It turned out to be that full circle experience, which I associate with another film, but that's down the line, you know. Well, I, I like some of the other films you worked for. We've got Dances with Wolves and Glory, for which you won the Academy Awards. What other films have you worked on? Well, again, so Field of Dreams with no slight to the to, to the low budget films I worked prior to that. But Field of Dreams was really the first film that I feel that I got a chance to work on that had a great cast, a great script. And the thing that made it even more unforgettable, we had a great crew. You know, that's why the director wanted to bring everybody back so we could do this again, because that doesn't happen often. I mean, it's kind of like if you have a if you have the New York Philharmonic, you don't want to start randomly changing, changing out clarinet players or fire the French horn section or get rid of the string bass people. Because if you can play as one unit, then you want to try to keep that working unit together as long as possible. Makes Again, sense. what I said earlier, it's a relationship business, which is one of the reasons it makes so makes it so hard to break in. It may look like it's strictly from a racial perspective but really what it is is that the scariest thing in any highly competitive field is the unknown quantity mm -hmm. and when you are the new kid on the block be it from gender from height from age from weight from whatever ethnicity you are the unknown quantity so now how do you transition to becoming the known quantity well in most cases it's going to take time it's going to take perseverance and you're going to have to figure out how to get in. You're going to have to lay in the cut, as we would say, until they, they need to make a change. Somebody's not available. So they, okay, that's the first time in four or five years they're looking for some new person to take over a job that this other person's done for the last 10 years. And you need to be standing right there ready to step into those shoes. Um, as I mentioned before, training day. I, I worked three really fun movies with uh, Eddie Murphy, uh, Boomerang uh, being one and probably one of the most just enjoyable movies to work on, A, because you're in New York on a five-day week with Paramount Pictures money in your back pocket. And so that means on a five-day week, that means you have weekends. And, you know, there's plenty of trouble you can get into in Manhattan on the weekends. I mean, forget the museums and the restaurants. There's like Bergdorf's for men. And then there's Bergdorf's for men. Oh, oh yeah. And then there's all the really fine boutiques up on 125th Street. There's whatever's going on in the Apollo. You know what I'm saying? There's plenty of jazz. Of course, I'm talking in the 90s. I don't know what New York is like now other than way out of my price range. But again. It was just, and then of course, Ed, Eddie's fun to work with. Uh, I also did Life with him, which was he and Martin Lawrence and, and a lot of other really, really great people, in, including Bernie Mac, who unfortunately has passed on. But, you know, sometimes you get to work on a, on a, on a film that not only is it funny on the screen, but it's also enjoyable behind the, the screen because that's not always the case. Okay, so, so tell me, what celebrities are fun to work with and which celebrities are difficult to work with? Okay, well, let's, let's work on the ones who are fun to work with. I already mentioned Eddie. Um, I would say one thing ab about Mr. Denzel Washington. Once he's on set, he is in character, okay? So if, if you have him playing somebody who's jovial, he's going to be jovial on set. If he's a serious badass uh, narc like he was in training day, then he's going to be a serious badass narc on set. But the fact that he is one of the most loyal uh, 
stars that I've had the opportunity of being around because he takes care of his crew, his team. And if there's an issue where he needs to use his star power to rein the producers in, he'll do that too. Um, uh, one other person I only had, I, actually I did work with this person twice, but it was only on one project where she wielded her star power. That was Miss Whoopi Goldberg. Okay. Whoopi seems in my, from people I knew that I worked with her prior, she always had a reputation of being very crew centric. So on this particular project where the producers decided they weren't going to spend any real money for craft service and kind of, you know, just kind of soft pedal the, the things that are important because an R, a film crew like the army marches on its stomach. So if you're not going to pay people their rate, then you have to feed them. Mm -hmm. And when Whoopi, who didn't work the first week of this particular project, found out that, you know, we were basically not quite eating dirt, but, you know, next best thing. She came out of her pocket. She called a crew meeting over the walkie talkie, had everybody assemble and say, OK, today. And she pulled out whatever the cash was in her pocket, which was considerable. She says, I'm buying craft service today. Because apparently they'd given this young lady who was responsible for feeding 70, 80 people like $100 a week. Good grief. That's, that pays for kibbles and bits, maybe. <laughs> uh, more like Alpo. <laughs> Whoopi wasn't having any of that. And so she says, okay, so this is today, not this week's, today's allotment for craft service. And she told these folks straight up, if you try to pull a stunt like this again on this project, I and the rest of the cast will take a walk. Yeah. I, was like, oh. I said, all right, sister. You know what I'm saying? So when you're working with folks who are not just in it for their own glorification, they, okay. yeah, they're going to get theirs, but they want to make sure that, you know, this is, you know, we're, we're not trying to talk about building the railroad in the 19th century. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, people do need to go home to their families. People need to have a lifestyle. Um, there are so many other folks, some folks who I had no idea I was going to have the opportunity of working with. Um, there was a television uh, remake that I did called 12 Angry Men. And the cast in that was just amazing. I mean, not only did I have Courtney B. Vance and the, the late Ossie Davis, uh, the the late uh, James Gandolfini prior to Tony Soprano, but I had Jack mm -hmm. Lemon, you know, I had Hume Cronin. I mean, uh, Michael T. Williamson. I mean, it was it was it was twelve people talking, which sounded like a job for me because it's all dialogue, and I'm right mm -hmm. there to make sure. But in that particular um, production, somebody visited our set, and my back was to the to the cast. And then I heard this voice say, well, you know, I heard the, the whole gang was up here on this stage. So I just came over to pay my respects. And with with my back turned, I said, that's Paul Newman. Ooh. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. And I turned around and I never even took a step closer to the gang of people that were glad handing and hugging and all of that, you know, because I mean, I said, wow. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, I was already working in a room full of movie stars, but it was just like, again, another one of those moments when as a kid from Southeast going to the movies mm -hmm. to then be in the room with some of these same people, like say even Burt Lancaster on Field of Dreams. And that was one of the guys that my mom considered one of her boyfriends. I mean, <laughs> along with Harry Belafonte, along with Sidney, um, along with William Marshall, uh, she had a couple of white boyfriends other than Burt Lancaster, but these were all like movie boyfriends, right? So I had to tell Mr. Lancaster as we were working together, I said, now you're one of my mom's boyfriends. Now, you don't know my mom, <laughs> and of course, she never met you. <laughs> but, you know, he still had that jaw, he still had that gleam in his eye, you know, and I'm like, I'm working with this guy. So, yeah, the people who weren't so much fun to work with unless they're still living, I can't really mention their names. There, 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 there was one in particular who I didn't realize that had I met them day one and started playing music for them, I would have had them under control. 
Mm. Because the first four weeks of this six, six week project, we were almost drawing straws as to who would hit this person with a baseball bat. And this wasn't on Field of Dreams. You know what I'm saying? I mean, everybody wanted a piece of this person. It made everybody's life miserable. It's miserable. Mm -hmm. And just somehow, because they wandered by my little workstation, and when we're not actually shooting, I've got music playing, all different types of music, because we've got all different types of musical taste in a crew. You know what I'm saying? So I wanted to make sure everybody got at least one moment today they could snap your fingers or meditate. Like say, for instance, on um, Waiting to Exhale, Angela Bassett would stick close to the sound cart. And even sometimes I would give her like, hey, you take it over because when she was she, when she was working her character up to go burn the clothes up and then burn up the car, she she put some music on so that she could just kind of help center her performance around mm -hmm. that. So I said, push this button if you want it louder, the softer, stop, play. And you know, once you, you you have this until we say first team, which means the real actors come on set and the lighting stand-ins go back and wait. So that that was an example of somebody who really kind of gravitated towards the fact that they could have their own music if they needed it. But this particular person just happened to wander by, heard Ella Fitzgerald playing and wanted to sit down and then started singing along with Ella. Mm. And then from that point on, they would spend the, the any time they weren't on camera, they would spend that time with me. And then they were the nicest people that you ever wanted to meet. But that first four weeks, it was like, we were drawing straws. It's like, Russell, do you want to do? No, man, I spent my entire life staying out of jail. So <laughs> I, I'm not going to volunteer. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Thanks to the 14th precinct out on Benning Heights and my dad. <laughs> you mentioned the celebrities who were fun to work with. Tell me who you admire. And it doesn't have to be a star. Maybe with someone back in DC who uh, was a mentor to you or someone who you observed and you thought they did a good job at whatever their particular career path was. So it can be somebody well-known or it could be somebody ordinary. Uh, and, and that's a really good question. And I would say, especially in the low budget days, you know, I think that anybody who was willing to put in 15 hours a day and your pay scale was $100 flat, that meant no overtime, no meal penalties, nothing like that. But um, I would say there was a there was a gentleman that I knew from D.C. named Lee Tari. And Lee and I and, and some other D.C. filmmakers are running through January Rock Creek Park, working on this small kind of like escaped slave narrative. And then the next time I saw Lee Tauri, because Lee Tauri, I wanted, and that would be L-E and then capital T-A-R-I. If people want to look him up on uh, imdb.com. But the next time I saw Lee Tauri, he was already on TV series. You know, he had already, he had moved to L.A. before I moved out there. And I was like, wow, he's already working. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. a, another person that I ended up meeting and working with on a small made for his AFI production was a gentleman named Bill Duke. And now Bill Duke had already been on screen. He had already done some, um, some serious theater work, but I got a chance to work with him in some of my early days, meaning 79, 1980, 1981, in those early days like that, because he was trying to get his directorial uh, certificate from AFI. And then he went on to become uh, probably one of the first African-American directors to to do a project that had no African-Americans in the cast mm. just to prove that we could because white directors had always been given the opportunity to, to, to direct any type of cast in any type of story, right, because of this mysterious universality myth that was applied automatically to certain directors, right? Whereas we were only thought of as having the ability to tell our own stories, mm -hmm. right? Same way you might find in the legal system, well, if it's a serious case involving um, 
African American victims and and white supposed uh, perpetrators, then we better have an all white jury because at least they can be impartial. It's like, excuse <laughs> me, <laughs> we can't be impartial, right? But you all can be impartial. So you had some of those same sort of things happen in in the industry. Uh, moving forward, there was a young man that I met at uh, Valley Forge Military Academy up in Pennsylvania. I'm only there recording sound effects after the main cast, who was the then unknown Tom Cruise and Sean Penn and Tim Hutton and some, some actors like that had already filmed their parts. We just came back to get some sound effects at the Military Academy. And there, there was this gentleman there who was part of the Cadet Corps and he said that he was going to be an actor and he ended up working in Spike Lee movies like Do the Right Thing. And he ended up uh, making a real name for himself in Breaking Bad. Mm. He had a little chicken place in Breaking Bad, but really it was just a cover for his real business. A guy named Giancarlo Esposito. I met him as a cadet. He was still a cadet at the military academy. Wow. But like a lot of the rest of us, we got a bug somewhere or the other. And he said, man, I'm going to be in this business. And when I ran into him years later, I said, yeah, Mr. Esposito, you remember the conversation we had in your dorm room? He's like, oh, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm so proud of the fact, because again, there is no easy way to get into a highly competitive field. And you hear no quite a bit. You have doors slammed in your face quite a bit. So let me put this little bit of bug in, in the ear of people who have dreams, whether they have anything to do with the entertainment business or not. Because this is something, Joy, that I may not have appreciated when I was a young person at AU, a younger person at Wilson, which is now Jackson Reed, a younger person at Kramer Junior High which is Kramer Middle School and on back down towards uh, what was Davis Elementary, I think it's a high school now, right? Is that the naysayers, and you're gonna run into your shared naysayers. Now, some of them feel like they have your best interest in heart. They could be a parent. They could be saying, well, you know, you're not quite the strongest reader, so I don't know if this is gonna be a, you know, a job that you're gonna excel at, or you're not that physically, you know, you don't have the sight, the kind of physical prowess that, you know, or whatever. Or then maybe you're just listening to haters because they just don't want you to end up doing something because they haven't done anything with their lives up to this point. OK. The naysayers are really important. OK, let me say that. the naysayers are really important. And why? Because if someone could literally whisper in your ear and talk you out of pursuing your dreams. I'm not talking about talk you out of going down to the corner and, 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 and stealing a beer and coming back out and coming back up and drinking on the front porch. I'm talking about pursuing your dreams. If mm -hmm. they could talk you out of pursuing your dreams, then you probably weren't going to achieve them anyway. Okay. So those naysayers are there to, okay, are you sure you want to do this? You know you don't have the skill set for that. And I'm like, yeah, but you know what? That's something I can work on and I'm going to find a way to overcome whatever may be holding me back. If that's your response, then keep pushing. Mm -hmm. Because here's the flip side. Say the Yankees do sign you. Then what? You don't show up again until the day before your first game? No, you got to get through training. You got to throw strikes you got to hit home runs or catch outfield flies, whatever your job is. Once they say yes, your learning curve starts to do like this. Mm -hmm. So that means you're going to have even more pressure on you to actually earn that position that somebody just grandfathered you into. Mm -hmm. Okay. So either way, it's going to be an uphill battle. It's just that if you did something that you said you wanted to do, hopefully that will keep resonating like it did when I'm standing in some urine stained alley in downtown LA on my 15th hour. Mm. And I'm saying, oh man, I did, you know, I did that. I did. And then I was like, then all of a sudden, this little thing would sit on my shoulder and said, Russell, didn't you say you wanted to be in show business? I'm like, yeah, I was like, 
Well, today, this is what show business looks like. Yeah. Okay? It's not going to be a red carpet today. It's going to be watch your footing. Don't step in that. You know what I'm saying? Keep your eye up up high because something that's coming out of that window is not going to be clear water. Who knows what that <laughs> is? It's not raining. Okay. Or you're broiling out in the middle of South Dakota. And the reason I'm in the Nevada right now is because I understand I can deal with the heat because I work just across the border in Death Valley on some of all fears. I know I can take the heat, but it's dry heat. You can have that humidity. I don't envy you that humidity. Don't miss it. But again, when those naysayers come up on you and they try to whisper in your ear, if you if you capitulate right then, then you're done. Well, you didn't capitulate. No. And in a highly competitive business, you came to the top. So I want you to take us to Oscar night, either oh my for God. dancing with wolves or for glory. <laughs> Tell us what was going through your mind. Uh, were you expecting to win? And when they announced it, how did you feel? What were your thoughts? Well, both experiences were completely unique on glory because my category is what they call a shared category which means that so part of my team which is me unfortunately i wish everybody else that was on the production side could be up there but the production mixer and generally two or three post-production mixers except in person if if we actually win our post-production lead mixer was nominated for two films the year we were up for glory they were also nominated for black rain now, the way they read the announcement, they just don't say, and the Oscar goes to glory. They start reading the names. Uh -huh. So if you go back and you can actually see these links on the Motion Picture Academy site, they say Donald O. Mitchell. So he's on his way to the stage like a bat out of hell. He doesn't <laughs> even care for which movie he's won. <laughs> he's won for one of them. Okay. And here's the other thing. Now you've got seven people that are sitting behind him. Actually, I'm sorry, six people sitting behind him who are still trying to figure out for which movie. Because mm -hmm. either it's the Glory team or it's the Black Rain team. So both teams had a Greg. So on the Black Rain team, there was Greg P. Russell. And our team was uh, Greg Rudloff. So now we're listening to that second name, like our lives depend on it. It was like, and it was Greg, and then it was like C, and we were like, okay, that's us. So now we stand up. Now he's already on stage because he doesn't even know which speech. He's, he's got one speech for one movie and one speech for the other one. We finally get up there. Now, I'm not supposed to say anything because we'd already predetermined, as you normally do with a shared award, that this person is going to do the acceptance speech because they don't want to hear from you. They're like... 30 seconds, see you by nothing personal, right? But he looked over his shoulder at me after 15 seconds and he said, jump in there. So that's why I get in there and I get to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. But I did, a, I made a mistake. I leaned over the microphone. When you see the video, I lean over the microphone as if I'm, as if I'm still on radio. And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. And so when I finally saw that video later, cause I taped this at home, I said, well, Russell, if you ever get a chance to go back, stand up straight. <laughs> There's no way you would have, A, convinced me that I was going to get nominated the second year. I mean, the very next year. And there's absolutely no, no way you would have convinced me I would have won two years in a row. As it turned out, the, year, the, the, the night before those Oscars for dances, there was a woman sitting in the crowd at a pre-Oscar event named Maya Angelou. Who I, I, hadn't, yeah, I hadn't seen her since I was doing Spirits. When she gave us an interview for uh, Gather Together in My Name. So oh. how is it that, I, and that interview I played to myself several different times when I was like trying to pump up my muscles and okay, I'm gonna take a big leap here. Do I have enough faith to do it? And my, it's like, these young people today, they need to do this and do that. And they need to risk whatever they need to risk to do it. You know, so for her to be there that night, that was the first time I really felt like I was going to win a second Oscar. Mm. So this time there aren't any competing, like nobody nominated for two Oscars or anything like that, two, two movies. But what happened, here's where my TV background came into play. 
when they read the names, I happened to be sitting on the aisle. The ABC cameraman is standing right next to me. So when I stand up, of course, I'm going to be out of focus. So with my TV background, I'm like, fine. I wait. He takes a couple steps back. I see him rack focus. <laughs> then when I see the tally light go on, then I know we're on the air. So if you watch that one, you'll see me walk all the way down the aisle, all the way up to the stage. Right. Smart man. Because I'm not going to do like Donald and ran, run over the ABC cameraman to get to the stage. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm going I'm, to I'm wait. I'm going to wait because who knows when I'll ever get back there. Right. And of course, this is before IMDB or the digital, you know, Internet, any of that kind of stuff. So I know these folks are like, wait a minute, didn't he win last year? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He won last year, didn't he? So I, I just want to make sure if I never get back there. They're going to see me walk all the way down that lauded aisle. Mm. OK, so um, not at McDonald's that particular time. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Oh, that particular time, I was smart enough to just call the Academy that morning of the nominations. I said, who got nominated for sound? And they read the, the names and they answered the wolves. I'm like, darling, we're going back to the Oscars and then we're not going to have to pay. Of course, there's going to be new dresses and new tuxes and that sort of stuff. but. You know. Okay, we're moving towards our close, but I got a couple of things more I want to hear. You okay, on. what does it mean to be a part of the academy? Okay, um, I would say for me, it, it it was one of those things that was very important, especially as a behind the scenes person, because this allegedly means that your work is on par with some of the greatest crafts people who have been part of this industry. And I know this back and forth, you know, from circles from time to time, whether the Oscars mean as much as they did. And so I would say, well, let's compare it to sports. Would you want to have the Super Bowl or would you be happy going back to having the Negro Football League championship and then the Football League championship? Mm -hmm. Would you want to have the NBA championship or the Negro League basketball championship? So mm -hmm. in my generation, the 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 move the the motivation was always to try to be the best in whatever you mm. wanted to do and the oscars and the and the emmys because they have two primetime emmys you know while i'm still breathing those are still the best of that particular field which doesn't necessarily mean people who haven't won either or the other aren't the best at what they do mm -hmm. because i guarantee you i'm not the first african-american who deserves to be a two-time Oscar winner. But since I was granted that, I want to live up to that. Because easily it could have been Sydney, easily it could have been a lot. Quincy Jones, he had six Oscar nominations. You're telling me he couldn't get one? <laughs> He's got 26 Grammys. So then wow. what does that tell you about the relative difference between how difficult it is to get a Grammy versus mm -hmm. how difficult it is to get one Oscar? Because mm -hmm. he, I think his first score was in Cold Blood. And he also won not only for just scores, but also for best songs. And it's like, Quincy? Yeah, he's gotten an honorary Oscar since then. But I'm saying on the competitive Oscar side, you're mm -hmm. telling me he didn't earn an Oscar? He went to Europe specifically to learn how to score strings so mm. he could do big, big picture you know, soundtracks. So what are you up to currently? Uh, other than rest, dress, and request, teach at UNLV, teach virtually at Cal State Northridge, and also looking for other opportunities still to help young people in their, you know, prospective field. But also, you know, the other things creatively I want to do. Sound design is one of them, but producing is something I'd like to get back into as well. Okay. Well, if you're in D.C. the next time, come back to visit the old Fort Davis. Yes. Francis Gregory Library. We would love to see you. And uh, we're looking forward to more great things from Russell Williams, too. Thanks I appreciate so much. I appreciate it, Joy. Everyone that's joined us today. Uh, I'm Joy Jones with D.C. Public Library here at Francis Gregory Neighborhood Library in Washington, D.C. Thanks. Mm -hmm.